Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with me this afternoon. I've got two issues that I want to talk with you about, and they're both really, really tragic. First off, I want to introduce you to Elvia Espinoza. She's 46. She was a teacher at Ben Hill Griffin Elementary School, a second grade teacher. She had three children. She's described as the perfect mother. She was a beloved teacher in the frostproof area. She had three children, and her three children were remarkable. And then I want to introduce you to her youngest child, Emmanuel Espinoza. He's 21. He's known as Manny. He was the 2020 frostproof valedictorian with a 4.5 GPA average. He was quoted at his high school graduation by saying, high school was just one of the chapters out of the many we will have throughout our lives. We still have so much to accomplish in the future that would define what kind of legacy the class of 2020 will leave behind. That's right. He was described as being a genius, of being remarkably brilliant. He was a pre-med student in his fourth year at the University of Florida. The next chapter of his life was to be a medical doctor. And it, interestingly enough, he was the youngest of three children. Mom called on Saturday morning and said, Manny, I haven't seen you in a while. They would text about every other day. I'd like to come up to Gainesville to see you. And he said, well, Mom, I'm visiting grandfather this weekend. He has an event, so I'll be down your way. She said, that's great. Why don't you stay with me at the house? And he said, sure, I'd love to. He arrived at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And we're going to show a clip. He had put earbud pods in his ear and he was playing No Church in the Wow when he drove up to the house and knocked on the front door. But before we go further, listen to this. This is the music he was listening to. That was the music in his ear when he walked up to the front door. He said that he had just been angry or not liked his mother for years and years. When we said, do you love her? He said, oh yeah, I love her. Do y'all get along? Yeah, eight out of 10 we get along. But I've wanted to kill her for years and I made up my mind as I drove from Gainesville, today is the day. And he then showed up at the front door. Now we got a video clip of what, of a ring camera, and you can see the knife as he approaches the front door. Notice behind his back, there's the knife. He tried to open the door and the door was locked, so he knocked on the door, and his beautiful mother was so excited to see her son 
she opened the door. The second she opened the door, he charged in and started stabbing her. He made the statement that he knew where to stab her for maximum effect because of his biology classes. We have another audio that we're not going to play from the inside of the house where she's screaming, Manny, 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 and he's not saying one word. He stabbed her in excess of 70 times. He once again told us he loved his mom. As she tried to get up off of the floor, he stabbed her some more. He said he noticed her hands were still moving, so he stabbed her some more. And then he told the detectives in his confession that he had cut his hand on the knife while stabbing his mother. And as he's standing at the kitchen sink, washing himself off and the knife, he wanted to ask his mother for the neosporin for the cut on his hand. But he noticed she was dead. He immediately called 911 and confessed. And we have a clip of that for you. Hello? Oh. Yes, tell me exactly what happened. I have someone. Okay, I've got help on the way. Stay on the line. What? Stay on the line with me, okay? I've got help on the way with, with, for you, okay? Okay, sir. Okay, I want you, yes, sir, I want you to take everything out of your pockets. And I want you to keep your hands out of your pockets, okay? Okay, how did, and how did this happen? I don't want to He said he stabbed his mom. Now I want you to understand, this lady who was a school teacher for 20 years actually moved around and taught at different schools while her children were in school so she could be close to them. I want you to understand she was really the perfect mom. I want you to understand that she was very proud of his accomplishments in going to the University of Florida, graduating number one in his high school class. And then I want you to understand that he viciously murdered her and confessed to it. We ask him, are you on any drugs or alcohol? No. He said, I've wanted to do this for some time, but I had, didn't have the nerve to do it. So I just made up my mind that today was the day. And it was. Quite frankly, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what else to say about this. It is one of the most bizarre murders that we've dealt with in a very long time. And when you see that he left a family behind that loved him, a mom that just worshiped her children. And at this very moment, she should have been in Ben Hill Griffin Elementary, creating a future and educating our second graders. It is incomprehensible as to what happened that day. Before I go on to the second event, are there any questions about this? Like you said, it really makes no sense when you hear this story. Is there any history of mental health issues? No history of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, no history of mental health abuse or needs, no history of Baker Acts, no arrest history, no problems at all. He was known as kind of being an introvert, kind of a quiet guy, zero issues. No 911 calls to the house? No 911 calls about him. And no argument with her. She wanted to come see him because she hadn't seen him in a while. They text every day, every other day. They stay in constant contact. No issues over 
money, she would send him money to make sure she appropriately funded his ability to go to college and enjoy the college life. And no argument that day. He never said a word to her. Did he say she beat him in the past or any time? Nothing. Before? Zero. And there's he was, she, he described her as a good mom, that she loved him and he loved her. And when we said, well, how well did you get along with your mom? And he says, oh, eight out of ten. It is the strangest event we've seen in a very long time. I know we're trying to make sense of something that doesn't make sense, but the annoying or getting on any elaboration on that or just normal mom stuff? He made one statement that sometimes mom talks out loud to herself. She'll ask herself questions and, and then answer her question. He said, that's going on for years. Well, who doesn't talk out loud? Oh, I forgot the keys. Oh, there they are. Just, he couldn't even seek out because our detectives asked him like, come on, man, why? I, I just, you know, I've, I've thought about killing her for years. Yes. Um, so. did, did he feel like she was a source of, like, pressure on him to uh, get good grades? And He didn't express any of that. Have you guys reached out to UF to see if there's any, like, reports that they've gotten about him or maybe we, his roommate? So far, we have gone back and searched his room at UF, and we don't see any information there, any notes, any communications that are indicative of this conduct or planning of such a murder. And obviously we will, as part of the follow-up investigation, as you understand, this happened just Saturday afternoon and we're still in the prelim preliminary stages of the investigation. But I think that's what makes it so difficult for any of us to understand is you've got this wonderful mom and she's not only wonderful for her family for her children but you've also got this mom that has spent years teaching and is so well loved in the community so it's it's very frustrating to all of us the next event that I'm going to talk about is a vehicle crash Three people died needlessly on Highway 60 east of Lake Wells and west of the county line on a two-lane highway. Today I'm going to show you one of the pe person that passed away. And this is not something we normally do, but it's important to understand this crash occurred, this triple fatality, at just before 10 p.m. on Saturday night. <clears throat> Hannah Weiser, 22, was driving a vehicle, and she was westbound on Highway 60. One of the witnesses to this crash said about a mile before the crash, he had to slow down because the car she was driving was traveling in excess of 100 miles an hour, and he had to slow down so that she could get back in line from passing him before she hit a semi-truck head-on. So less than a mile from this scene where she died in a head-on collision that she created, we have a witness that said, I literally had to slam on brakes and take an evasive maneuver so she could get out of the way from hitting a semi head on. She continued westbound and a mile later while driving her black Ford Flex, she chose to pass another vehicle. As she was passing that vehicle driving reckless and we anticipate in about the same 100 miles an hour, she hit a Ford F-150 head-on. When she hit that vehicle head-on, 
she killed two wonderful people. The people she killed were Luis Rodriguez, who was 54, and Carmen Maldonado, who was 52. They had a three-year-old child in the back seat, their grandchild. They were returning home from a day at Bush Gardens with their grandchild, minding their own business in their travel lane, doing what was right. She passed this vehicle, it's vehicle three in the crash, and hit this pickup truck head on, killing both grandparents and killing herself. The other folks who are from Great Britain were also involved in the crash. They couldn't get out of the way. They were all treated and released from the hospital. The three-year-old was air flighted to Arnold Palmer and was subsequently released the next day with minor injuries. They, they had the child on a concussion protocol because of the viciousness of the crash. But grandma and granddad, quite appropriately, had the baby seat belted the right way in the back seat. That's why he survived. But did I tell you that Carmen was also a school teacher at a school in St. Lucie County? Right now, at this time, Carmen should have been in class teaching children. Carmen and her husband were doing the right thing by taking the grandchild to Bush Gardens for a great day, and I understand it was a great day. Hannah had been at the beach that day, was returning, and she was wearing a bikini at the time of the crash. We've talked to family members, and the family members said they know of no emergencies, why she would have needed to, to have been driving that fast or that reckless. Hannah also left a three-year-old child without a mother. The three-year-old was not in the car, but Hannah has a three-year-old child that now has to grow up without mom, all because of her recklessness, her excessive speed, and we don't know about drugs or alcohol yet that will be part of the examination that's done by the medical examiner that will be forthcoming later. But we did find a crushed beer can in her lap that was impelled into her leg. Whether that was an old beer can from in the car or a current beer can, we can't say at this stage of the investigation. It's sad for everyone, but this lady caused the crash that killed her and killed two wonderful people to include a school teacher. This is one of those crashes that absolutely unequivocally did not have to happen. This is one of those crashes that she just barely avoided a head on a mile down the road and still continued to drive that way and still continued to pass cars into head on traffic. We don't have all the answers we will have all the scientific answers at the conclusion of the investigation because our traffic homicide people are simply the very best. And we've got one of our most senior traffic homicide detectives working on this case. But it breaks our heart for Hannah's family and certainly for the innocent family as well because none of them deserve to die that night. But that's what happens when you get behind a car, when you do stupid things at high rates of speed, for whatever reason, bad things can happen. And this is one example of that. Are there any questions about this? Okay, thank you very much, take care.